Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. This is the true worshiper of God. God bless you. Hey, listen, if you haven't subscribed to Richard Luke Jr.'s channel on YouTube, he has a very good message. Some of you have heard him speak. He is a great speaker of the word of God. He can bless you in 16 minutes and 20 minutes, 13 minutes with the word. Very good speaker of the word. Um, he happens to be my first cousin out there in Dallas, Texas. We have never met personally. Never met, but I do plan to make a trip out there to see him. Richard Luke Jr., check out the message that he has, the Christian walk, and he also has, God, forgive me, how could I forget, I just seen the message. Subscribe to the channel, don't forget to hit the like button. When you're subscribed to his channel, please, this brother is really a blessing. I mean, God is using this man, and he is my pastor, believe it or not. Yes, he is. And I'm 61 and he's 47. But he's a very humble soul. I love him. I love him. He's a blessed man. I'm not just saying that because we're blood relatives. I'm saying that because um, he is an anointed man of God. Amen. I thank all of you who are joining me today on this channel. The title of this message is El Shaddai. El Shaddai. And how I came across this message is how I come to speak every message is by the Holy Spirit. And I'm fearless today, brothers and sisters, because Jesus sent the Comforter to me, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said, Jesus has a message for you, man of God. And the message was this that Jesus gave to me, and he gave it to me to give to the rest of the family of God on this channel. He's, the message was this, I did not give you a spirit of fear. Like I said, the title of this message is El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. God Almighty. That's what that word means, El Shaddai. So that's why I'm fearless today. And the Lord said, I did not give you a spirit of fear. I gave you a spirit of power, love, and a made up mind to trust Believe and obey every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. I want you who are listening to know that God has a few names for us to live by. We are supposed to live by the name of of God. I don't know if anyone ever told you that, but you're supposed to live by the name of God. Well, what do you mean live by the name of God? Well, I thought I was brave cuz I was in the Marines and I'm I'm a, I show bravery but I found out that I was full of a lot of fear. And I found this out because God gave me a message. And that message is titled, El Shaddai, God Almighty. And I found out that I was full of fear. Because if I had been living by this name, God Almighty, I would have saved myself a whole lot of problems. 
I would have had the victory just about every time I went to war in anything. Do you hear me? And I'm going to show you something here. Pay attention to this message. I want you who are listening to know that God has a few names for us to live by so we can walk with God and overcome everything that stands between you, between us and God. All right? So we can walk with God and overcome everything that stands between you and God. The first name I want you to live by is El Shaddai. God appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai in the book of Genesis. When we go to Genesis, we'll see that that's what he did. He appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and introduced himself as God Almighty. When God revealed himself to Moses, he said, I am Yahweh, the true God who saves. In the book of Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, God says to Moses, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. God says to Moses, I am Yahweh the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty. But I did not reveal my name Yahweh to them. And I reaffirmed my covenant with them. Under its terms, I promised to give them the land of Canaan where they were living as foreigners. Did you hear that? He tells Moses that he appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai. And he did not reveal his name to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Yahweh. Look at this. God has given us names to live by. He gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob names to live by. A name to live by. Hmm. Where are you going with this, true worshiper? Every reference to El Shaddai shows us a picture of a God who is all powerful, who is mighty and does what he says. And what he says does come to pass. When God speaks, it will happen. And so, so when he's when he revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, he showed them that when I speak, it will come to pass, and they believed it. They believed it. I'm going to show it to you. Watch this. When God speaks, it will happen. Just look at Genesis chapter 1. God said, let there be light, and there was light. This is El Shaddai speaking. This is God Almighty. And it's good for you to know all the names of God. Because this is your armor. 
This is your weapon. This is your full armor of God when you know his name and live by these names. I'm only going to give you a couple of names. Watch this. Mm. When God said, let there be light and there was light, why did light appear? Why did light appear? The disciples told us when a storm hit and they were on the water. And they thought Jesus didn't care about them. And Jesus told the wind and the rain to be quiet, to calm down, to shut up, to be still. And it obeyed him. And it obeyed him. Jesus was showing us who have read the scripture. And he showed the disciples. That he is in God and God is in him. And he is God almighty. Only God almighty can do this. And this is why I am fearless today. Because I'm doing something that I have not been doing is I'm living by the name of God. It makes my life so much better that he revealed his name to me as El shall die for a reason. Not just to know it, not just to spread it around, but to live and walk by it. He's God Almighty. And I'm fearless today only because of that. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 17. I want you to look at verses 1 and 2. Look at Genesis 17, 1 and 2. I love him. Genesis chapter 17. Watch mm -hmm. this. New Living Translation reads, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. Look what God just spoke to Abraham. It was nothing else for him to do. He said, "Woo." Serve me faithfully. He said, let there be light and there was light. He told Abraham to serve me faithfully. And Abraham served him faithfully. And live a blameless life. And Abraham lived a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. This is El Shaddai speaking to Abraham. Genesis 17, verses 1 and 2. This was God's covenant with Abraham. And when Abraham heard it, I want you to notice his reaction. In Genesis chapter 17, look at the verse, look at verse 17. Then Abraham bowed to the ground. But he laughed to himself in disbelief. Whoa. Because he's 99 years old. And God says he's going to give him descendants. Abraham knows he's too old to have to even make a baby. With Sarah. And so is Sarah. But he bowed, the Bible says in Genesis ch chapter 17, verse 17, then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of a hundred, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? Mm. 
But look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. But God replied, no, Sarah, your wife will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. So in the face of physical impossibility, God declares Abraham and Sarah will have descendants. Only El shall die. God Almighty could say this, speak this, for it to come to pass. In the face of physical impossibility, this couple is too old. Abraham and Sarah will have descendants. I am El Shaddai Almighty. It would be as I have said. And the following year, Abraham did have a son and named him Isaac. When he turned 100 years old, Isaac was conceived. Hmm. Who is the father of Jacob? Isaac was born, who became the father of Jacob. And this leads me to Genesis chapter 28. Come with me, please, to Genesis chapter 28. Read with me verses 1 through 4. New Living Translation, it reads, So Isaac called for Jacob, blessed him, and said, You must not marry any of these Canaanite women. They're in Canaan right now. But he tells Isaac, Isaac tells his son Jacob, You must not marry any of these Canaanite women. Instead, go at once to Padaram, to the house of your grandfather, Bethuel, and marry one of your uncle Laban's daughters. May God Almighty, El Shaddai, bless you and give you many children. And may your descendants multiply and become many nations. May God pass on to you and your descendants the blessings he promised to Abraham. May you own this land where you are now living as a foreigner. For God gave this land to Abraham. And if you know the story, Jacob's son, were known as the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob had 12 sons. Amen. There's power in the name of God. You will see Isaac speaking with complete faith in God. You have seen Isaac speak with complete Faith in God in Genesis chapter 28, verses 1 through 4. Because he is El Shaddai, God Almighty. Now in Genesis 35, verses 11 through 13, listen to what God says to Jacob. I want you to listen to what God says to Jacob in Genesis chapter 35. Look at verse 11. Well, let me start at verse 9. Genesis 35, let's start at verse 9. Now that Jacob had returned from Padaram, God appeared to him again at Bethel. God blessed him, saying, Your name is Jacob, but you will not be called Jacob any longer. From now on, your name will be Israel. 
So God renamed him Israel. And that's why we call it the 12 tribes, Jacob's sons, the 12 tribes of Israel and not the 12 tribes of Jacob. I just want to throw that in there. Then God said in verse 11 to Jacob, he says this to Jacob. Then God said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. You will become a great nation, even many nations. Kings will be among your descendants, and I will give you the land I once gave to Abraham and Isaac. Yes, I will give it to you and your descendants after you. Then God went up from the place where he had spoken to Jacob. Mm. I just want you to see this name, El Shaddai, God Almighty. In Genesis chapter 43, look at verse 14. Genesis chapter 43. Won't be before you long, I hope not. I'm going to make my point here. We're going to get to it. Ah, look at Genesis chapter 43, New Living Translation, verse 14. May God Almighty give you mercy as you go before the man so that he will release Simeon and let Benjamin return. But if I must lose my children, so be it. Okay, what well, true worship, what are you talking about? Remember, Joseph's brothers were jealous of him. They hated him because Jacob loved Joseph because their dad loved him. So they came up with this plot to kill Joseph. Joseph, you know, his dad gave him a coat of many colors. And Joseph told him that he had a dream and that they they going to bow down to him. That the stars bowed down and, and the wheat and the barley was bowing down. And he was saying, he was telling his brothers this. And he even said this to his father. And he was saying, what, what? and they were like just jealous of Joseph. That God was working with Jacob's son. So they sell him into slavery. You know the story. He, he, he then... He's working for Potiphar and then he gets thrown in prison because Potiphar's wife is trying to have sex with him and he runs from her and he says, no, I'm not doing that. Um, that's wicked. And um, she lies and says that he tried to have his way with her. So, you know, he gets thrown in the prison. And then, you know, make a long story short, he comes out of prison. He's interpreting the dream and he's blessed and he becomes the prince of Egypt, second in command to Pharaoh. And he's in Egypt. So then it's a famine in the land all around. And there's a famine in Canaan and they need food. So the brothers go to Egypt to buy food. And when they get there, they have to get the food from their brother Joseph, who they haven't seen in um, a long time. You know, maybe 12, 15 something years went by. They didn't know how he looked because he was 17 when they threw him in the pit in a, in a, in a hole and then sold him into slavery. And um, so they don't, they don't know that this is Joseph who they're talking to. And the Lord has blessed Joseph to store up all the food and wheat and stuff like that. And um, he's making right, right and wise decisions. And God has told Joseph what to do um, to outlast the famine that's going to strike the whole planet just about. And Joseph has all the food stored up for seven years and water and stuff like that for the people, for the Egyptians and for all those um, who come to Egypt that need food. So his brothers came to Egypt and Joseph knew who they, who they were, but they didn't know that that was their brother Joseph. And so Joseph, um, you know, they come to buy food and then Joseph asks him, how's their father doing? And they tell him, and then he asks them, um, do they have a, another brother, a younger brother? And they said, yeah. And he's, he's at home with dad. 
And then Joseph said, well, if you want some food, then I'm, I'm going to give you... I'm going to give you probably something for a day or two, but I need you to bring that, that younger brother back to you, back to me. I want to see him. The next time you come to buy some food, bring the, the little boy, bring Benjamin. And so Jacob does not want to, he doesn't feel good about Benjamin going with his sons um, to Egypt. And, um, he, he just doesn't feel good about it. And then he says, well, if I have to give up my son, you know, or whatnot, then, you know, I trust God. So he lets the boy go. So in Genesis chapter 43, verse 14, this is what's going on. The brothers return to Egypt, but on one condition, they have to bring Benjamin. So in verse... Um, Verse 13, uh, it says, Jacob says, then take your brother and go back to the man. And to the man, which is, they don't know, that's Joseph. He says, well, take your brother and go back to the man. May God Almighty give you mercy as you go before the man so that he will release Simeon. So he says, well, I'm going to hold one of your brothers here till you bring back the younger brother, Benjamin. So, this is what's happening. And he says, so he will release Simeon and let Benjamin return. But if I must lose my, ch my children, so be it. And, um, wait, wait a minute. So, Jacob gives a benediction as his sons were about to go off to Egypt to meet the prince of Egypt, which is Joseph the one who is second in command to Pharaoh. And they have no idea the man they met days earlier is their brother, Joseph, who they plotted to kill and instead sold him into slavery. Jacob is fear fearful for his youngest son, Benjamin's life, who Joseph said, to bring to Egypt. When they return, when they return, and Jacob prays to El Shaddai to grant him mercy. Jacob trusts God will do this because he already said he would. So, Jacob was kind of fearful at first. And then he prayed and asked God for mercy. That his children, both his sons will return. And then, you know, he just, and he says he trusts God. He trusts that God would do this because he already said he would. That God would give him mercy. Now, Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers in Genesis chapter 45. What does this have to do with God Almighty? Keep listening. We already know. It's a blessing if you live by the name. So what I'm showing you, people who are living by the name of El Shaddai, God Almighty. You know, the this, this second in command in Egypt, no one knows that that's Joseph. Jacob doesn't know. His son doesn't know. And he has the power to hold one of the brothers. And um, if he feels that the brothers um, that came to buy food stole something, they're not right, he'll keep, he'll, he will keep Benjamin. But he's making them think that. He's making them feel that way. He's making them feel that way. So you need to, I'm going to keep this brother because I don't trust you. Bring back the other one and I'll let him go. But now the brothers have explained to Joseph that, listen, we, we cannot go back without Benjamin because it would kill our father. He really loves him. And he loves, you know, he's already lost another son. 
that we don't know what happened. We don't know um, what happened to them. And they're lying. They know what happened to them because they the one did harm to them. So, but Joseph misses his father, Jacob. He misses his brother. And Joseph and Benjamin were born from the same mom. And they're very close. Joseph's very close to his little brother. So in Genesis chapter 45, starting the third verse, Joseph identifies himself. He reveals himself to his brothers. And Joseph can can he can he he, he can no longer, you know, play this game with them. Because now he's in tears. But he tells them something. Verse 45, Joseph could stand it no longer. Verses 1, I'm going to start at verse 1. Joseph could, could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. Then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could could hear him, and word of it quickly carried, carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer, and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years and there would be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God, so it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all the land of Egypt. So come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Goshen where you can be near me with all your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and everything you own. I will take care of you there, for there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, you, your household, and all your animals will starve. Then Joseph added, look, you can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that I really am Joseph. Go tell my father of my honored position here in Egypt. Describe for him everything you have seen, and then bring my father here quickly. Weeping with joy, he embraced Benjamin, and Benjamin did the same. Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them. And after that, they began talking freely with him. Look at um, Genesis chapter 46, verses 1 through 4. So let me tell you this. So the reason God only appeared as El should die to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because it was all they needed to know. It was all they needed to know that alone, that alone was enough for them. Genesis chapter 46, verses 1 through 4. So Jacob set out for Egypt with all his possessions. And when he came to Bathsheba, he offered sacrifices to God of his father, Isaac. During the night, God spoke to him in a vision. Jacob Jacob, he called. Here I am, Jacob replied. I am God, the God of your father. The voice said, do not 
be afraid to go down to Egypt. For there I will make your family into a great nation. I will go with you down to Egypt and I will bring you back again. You will die in Egypt, but Joseph will be with you to close your eyes. Ain't that a blessing? So the reason God, again, only appeared as El Shaddai to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is because it was all they needed to know. That alone was enough for them. When Moses came 400 years later, okay, when Moses came 400 years later, God's people needed delivering. God made himself fully known as Yahweh, the God who saves to Moses. Look at Exodus chapter 6. Look at verse 6, New Living Translation. Therefore, Moses... Say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppressions. This is 400 years later. God sends Moses into Egypt to deliver his people, the nation of Israel, out of Egypt. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. Hmm. Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. In the same way that the name El Shaddai was enough for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to believe God, it is enough for you and I in 2024. And I say this because we are in a privileged position of knowing Yahweh. We're in a privileged position of knowing Yahweh Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty who saves. So when you feel that you are being overcome, by the many sins you battle day in and day out constantly and failing and struggling to the point of giving up, remember what the Lord Jesus, the Messiah said, take heart because I have overcome the world. The cross with all its shame was the very place of victory for God. It may have looked like the world had overcome him. He was dying, but actually it was God's sovereign plan that Jesus would go to the cross to die in our place for our sins and to be raised to life again. When it looked like death won, God was overcoming the world. When you belong to Jesus, you belong to the overcomer. El Shaddai has made a covenant with his people, and it's not based on our ability to be faithful to him, but on his faithfulness to us. Look at 2 Kings. This is it. 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. I've spoke long enough. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestors David had done. He removed the pagan shrines. He smashed the sacred pillars. And he cut down the Asherah poles. He broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. Remember when God sent in the snakes because of their disobedience? And God told Moses to, to make a brass serpent 
snake and put it on a pole and tell the people if they'll look at it, they'll be healed. But the people, instead of looking at it, they started worshiping it. They started worshiping it and making and, and bringing offerings and sacrifices to it. So this is what Hezekiah, Hezekiah tore all that down. Because you're going to only worship God in this place. So Hezekiah turned, um, tore all that down. He did everything right. The Bible says there was no king before or after him that did what Hezekiah did. Amen. So 2 Kings chapter 18. Let me set you up here. The Assyrians are coming to attack Jerusalem. And they are mighty. They got something like a million soldiers. And Hezekiah's army is probably like about 3,000. And they've been, they've been running through countries just destroying everybody. Destroying everybody. So then he threatens Hezekiah. But Hezekiah knows El Shaddai. Look at 2 Kings chapter 18. Look at verse 5. Let's get to it. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything, and he carefully obeyed all the commands the Lord had given Moses. So the Lord was with him, and Hezekiah was successful in everything he did. He revolted against the king of Assyria and refused to pay him tribute. He also conquered the Philistines and far, as far distant as Gaza and its territories from their smallest outpost to their largest walled city. So the king of Assyria he wants to destroy Hezekiah and the whole city of Jerusalem because Hezekiah refused to pay him taxes. Come with me to verse 19. Chapter 18, verses 19, it reads, Then the Assyrian king's chief of staff told them to give this message to Hezekiah. This is what the great king of Assyria says. What are you trusting trusting in that makes you so confident? Do you think that the mere words, do you think that mere words can substitute for military skill and strength? Who are you counting on that you have rebelled against me? On Egypt? If you lean on Egypt, it would be like a reed that splinters beneath your weight and pierces your hand. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is completely unreliable. But perhaps you will say to me, we are trusting in the Lord our God. But isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and Jerusalem worship only at the altar here in Jerusalem? This is what, this is what uh, the Assyrians are saying to Hezekiah. And he said, hey, he, 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 see, now listen, so this king is insulting the almighty God. He is saying a bunch of blasphemous things. Look at um, verse 28 in chapter 18. Verse 28 says, then the chief of staff stood and shouted in Hebrew, to the people on the wall. Listen to this message from the great king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He would never be able to rescue you from my power. I want to show you why El Shaddai, God calls himself almighty. Watch this. Don't let him fool you, verse 30. Don't let him fool you into trusting in the Lord by saying the Lord will surely rescue us. This city would never fall into the hands of the Assyrian king. Okay, verse 31. Don't listen to Hezekiah. 
These are the terms the king of Assyria is offering. Make peace with me, open the gates and come out. Then each of you can continue eating from your own grapevine and fig tree and drinking from your own well. Then I will arrange to take you to another land like this one, a land of grain and new wine, bread and vineyards, olive groves and honey. Choose life instead of death. Don't listen to Hezekiah when he tries to mislead you by saying the Lord will rescue us. Have the gods of any other nation ever saved their people from the king of Assyria? What happened to the gods of Hamath and Arpad? And what about the gods of Sepharim, Hena, and Iva? Did any god rescue Samaria from my power? What god of any nation has ever been able to save its people from my power? So what makes you think that the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? But the people were silent and did not utter a word because Hezekiah had commanded them, do not answer him. Look at um, chapter 19, look at verses 5 through 7. After Hezekiah officials delivered the king's message to Isaiah, now they're going to bring all this that the Assyrian king is saying, he's going to do to Hezekiah and Jerusalem and tell them don't put their faith or their trust in God. They take all this to the prophet, God's prophet, Isaiah. After King Hezekiah officials delivered the, officials delivered the king's message to Isaiah, the prophet replied, say to your master, this is what the Lord says. Do not be disturbed by this blasphemous speech against me from the Assyrian kings, messengers. Listen, I myself will move against him. You hear what God is saying? I myself will move against him and the king will receive a message that he is needed at home. So he will return to his land where I will have him killed with a sword. Hmm. Did you hear that? Look at verse 10. This message, chapter 19, verse 10, this message is for, is for King Hezekiah of Judah. Don't let your God in whom you trust deceive you with promises that Jerusalem will not be captured. God just told Hezekiah that he's going to move against this, this Assyrian king, this nation. And don't be disturbed by the blasphemous words and things that he is saying against the Almighty God. He's going to receive a message that he is needed back home. And when he gets there, I'm going to have him killed by his own sons. Watch this. You know perfectly well, verse 11, that the kings of Assyria... I'm at 19, verse 10. Oh, we read that. Let me go back. This message is for King Hezekiah of Judah. Don't let your God in whom you trust deceive you with promises that Jerusalem will not be captured by the king of Assyria. Look at verses 32 through 37. And here it comes. This is it. Wrapping it up. Chapter 19, verse 32. And this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria just said, don't put your trust in the promises of God. And don't, and don't let God deceive you into thinking that Jerusalem would not be captured by the king of Assyria. And this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. His armies will not enter Jerusalem. They will not even shoot an arrow at it. They will not march outside its gates with their shields, nor build banks of earth against its walls. This is God saying that no weapon formed against you, Jerusalem. No more, no weapon formed against you, Hezekiah. No weapon formed against you who are listening right now will prosper. Verse 33. 
The king will return to his own country by the same road on which he came. He will not enter this city, says the Lord, for my own honor. For my own honor and for the sake of my servant David, I will defend this city and protect it. That night, verse 35, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. See, God himself said, he said, I myself, I'm going to move against them. He said, don't you worry about nothing. I'm going to handle this one myself. So they refer to him as an angel of the Lord, went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpse everywhere. Then King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and returned to his own land. He went home to his capital of Nineveh and stayed there. Verse 37, one day while he was worshiping in the temple of his god, Nisroch, his sons, Adramelech and Sherzir killed him with their swords. They then escaped to the land of Ararat and another son, Es Sarshadon became the next king of Assyria. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know something today. Walk in the name of God Almighty. Trust in him. Just like Hezekiah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And remember, He's also Yahweh Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty who saves. It's time to live by the name of God. It's time to walk by the name of God. What did he tell Abraham? When God speaks something, it comes to pass. And God is speaking something in your life who are listening. He says, I have a, I made a covenant with you. So walk faithfully before me. In other words, God is saying, when God is saying, trust me. While you're living on this earth, trust me. Have faith in me. And that's the difference. I'm fearless today because he told me, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but I gave you the spirit of love power and a made up mind that trusts, believes and obeys every word that comes out of my mouth. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. This is the true worshiper of God. Remember, El Shaddai loves you. <laughs>